Welcome to this product demo video. If you are new to FTK or have been away for a while, this video can serve as an introduction or a reintroduction to some of the features and workflows available to you in Forensic Toolkit, FTK. So we'll be demoing various features and workflows related to Forensic Toolkit. So we'll have some time codes posted here on the screen and then we'll also divide this video into chapters so you can either watch through it all in one go or you can jump to features that you care about, that sort of thing. It's gonna be very general, lightning round because we don't have a full training session here to go through it all, but it'll give you an idea of what you can expect in the tool, some of the key features and why and how it may be able to help you in your investigations and the different things that you're running. So welcome to the video. I am Justin Tolman, the Director of Training over North America for Access Data and Xtero Company. And just as a quick history lesson, if you're coming back or you've heard of Forensic Toolkit, Access Data's Forensic Toolkit, uh, Xtero purchased Access Data just a few months ago in late 2020. Same software though, Forensic Toolkit. So you'll see Access Data branding, but it's under the Xtero name now. Perfect. All right, let's jump into it and start looking at some of the features and workflows related to FTK. Okay, so before we jump into Forensic Toolkit and show some of the features and workflows, we're gonna take a look at what comes with FTK, a little bit of the preliminary setup, and a little bit about how FTK works under the hood. So first off, once you get Forensic Toolkit, you will get, of course, Forensic Toolkit. Shocker, okay? But you also, on the install disk, will get FTK Imager to create your bit-for-bit -bit copies, your forensic copies, primarily designed for dead box forensics, but it does have minimal triage, disk mounting, memory capture, re registry capture, those types of things built into it, but its primary focus is dead box forensic image creation. You'll also get registry viewer if you need to take deep dive into the various registry hives within a Windows machine. You'll also get password recovery toolkit if you need to break into encrypted containers, documents, those types of things, you can use password recovery toolkit. All three of these pieces of software integrate with Forensic Toolkit as a package. While not within the install ISO currently for Forensic Toolkit, we do support the known file filter and is available for download through our website and will connect up with FTK through the interface. Forensic Toolkit comes in three basic flavors. The base version, FTK, then you have FTK Lab, and then you have FTK Enterprise. You'll notice in my video that it will say FTK Enterprise. We're only going to go over features that are in the base version for this demo but the interface between the three versions is pretty much the same and a lot of the features are shared. To oversimplify and summarize the difference between lab and the regular and enterprise and the regular, lab allows for more collaboration, centralized databases and things like that. An enterprise is designed to operate within an enterprise environment, allowing an IT or security department to reach out within their infrastructure and acquire data, remediate data, et cetera, within their own network. One of the features that gives Forensic Toolkit a lot of its power is the backend database that powers a lot of the things that you're going to do within the case. By default, we use Postgres. However, we also support MS SQL if you have it already installed in your environment or would like to install it in your environment, it is supported with Forensic Toolkit. Within this database, you can store your case information, user information, you can even store things such as processing profiles, filters, column sets in which to share across users and cases. What this also does for you as the user is you never have to save your work within FTK. It's automatically written to the database and is ready for you whenever you leave, come back, it's good to go. Shown here on the screen is the FTK database management window. And you can see in the user that I'm logged in as, there are two cases assigned to them, currently main and sample. They, you can have as many cases assigned to a user and active as is necessary for your current workload. Assigning cases to a user will prevent other users from working on or seeing that other user's case. 
And before we move on from the database, another benefit, of course, is the ability to store large amounts of case data and to recall that data very quickly and display it to you, the user, in an organized way. And we'll see that as we go through the demo that uh, we display a lot of different columns and a lot of different metadata, and all that is stored within your database being called up and shown to you very quickly. Okay, so now that we've covered the database and kind of some of the setup and what comes with FTK, we're actually going to jump into the interface and look at what FTK will show the user, some of its key features, and then we'll Tarantino our way back into processing options and loading up the evidence so that you see where we're going and then we see how we get there. So we'll run it like that. So let's jump into the interface and take a look at what we've got. Okay, welcome to the FTK interface. We're in a case now, and the default tab that you're gonna start on is the Explore tab. Now, the Explore tab is pretty straightforward. It presents the user with the ability to manually navigate through the file structure, view files, view what's in a directory, that sort of thing. However, one thing we can show is that the interface is highly customizable to fit your needs. You can change the columns, you can change the layout from the panes, you can change what panes are visible all within the interface very manual, you can save it so that it stays that way from case to case, so that you, the user, have an interface that works for you. Looking around here, we've got our file list pane at the bottom. That's gonna display a lot of the metadata associated with the files that you're clicked on. Here we have some email. So if we wanted to see things related to email, we could come in and change our column set to email, and it's going to display some of that information. Now. The Explore tab may not be the best place to view that, and we'll look at how we can jump between, but just know that you can look at any type of file in the Explore tab and get that information by switching up your interface just a little bit. Also within your file content window, this is where you view the data that you're looking at. Pretty standard, if you wanna view an email, you gotta have some way to show it. If it's a picture, if it's a document, et cetera, you gotta have some way to look at it. So we have our view here. We can also look at more file properties that may or may not, depending on your column set, be displayed at the bottom. And so we can see Outlook settings, we can see various file system settings up above based on where it is on the system. These are very specific to what the file is. So if it was a graphic image, we would see stuff related to graphic files. And if email, we see email, documents, documents, so on and so forth. So that's the Explorer tab in a nutshell. We'll see these themes of customization in the visual pane system as we move through the other tabs and show our content. The place that I like to start when working a case in FTK is the overview tab. And it is exactly what its name implies. It's the overview of your case. When we come into the overview tab, we can see various top level categories, file extension. So if we were to expand that out, we can see all the files within the case broken out by their file extension. Cool, we can jump down and if we wanted to look at .exes, we can just select it and we have nothing but exe files. We can go through and look for any potentially hazardous files, malware, etc., that may be running on our system. By using things like file category within the overview tab, we have the potential to get to our evidence quickly and make determinations about how to proceed within our case. So if we're working something where we need to view, say, Microsoft Word documents, we can just come down into documents, Microsoft documents, and we break it down by the various types of Microsoft documents you may need to look at. So for example, if I choose Microsoft Word 2010, we can see all the documents listed here and their associated metadata, so we can see author, last save by, total editing time, etc. things that you may care about. If we go ahead and select one, like the Apocalyptic Manifesto, we can see the uh, little thing from Mission Impossible, Fallout, okay? But we can see the content of the document. If we needed to then look at spreadsheets, we can easily jump down into spreadsheets and view spreadsheet data, complete with the various tabs that they may have, okay? So we see spreadsheets like spreadsheets, docs like docs, pictures like pictures, et cetera. But the overview tab allows you to jump through these different things very quickly and get an overview of your case without having to navigate around, without having to find things manually, no searching, no filtering at this point. Okay, we'll talk about that later. The overview tab will also display things that relate to the status of a file, not necessarily its content. So for example, if it's an encrypted file, we have a spot within the overview tab that will display files that FTK detects as encrypted or containing encrypted content. 
If we've run known file filter, whether to ignore files or to alert us of potential evidentiary files, those will be grouped up inside of file status. Other things such as optical character recognition, uh, data carved files, bad extensions, etc., will also be grouped up here. If you're law enforcement, we would also display Project Vic hits in this section of file status Project Vic matches. The other tab that's similar to the overview tab, but a little more lower level, but still kind of gives you this bird's eye view level of your case is the system summary tab. This has been recently updated. So if you've used FTK in the past, you may remember system information. We've done a lot of work improving the data and the way that that data is displayed within this tab. And it's now called system summary. We can see some examples here. We have two windows evidence items loaded in. So currently we're displaying all of them. We can filter down by just one or the other, and you'll see the numbers appropriately change there. Or if you just want to view it all, you can do that as well. So we have things related to applications such as install, prefetch, user assist, so on and so forth. Hardware such as USB devices that have been mounted within the system, as well as networking information. If we come down and select, for example, network interfaces, we can see the IP addresses hooked to those. We can also see under connection Wi-Fi access points that the device has been connected to. This information is pulled out of the registry and made available to the user in an easy to read and digestible way. Also easy to report, export into a consumable way by non-tech users. This file list pane can easily be exported out into an XLSX or what normal people just call Excel, I guess, and, and viewed and filtered there if they're not going to be looking at it in our forensic software. You can go ahead and pause the video to see some of the other things that are listed here. Just be aware that it is contextual based on what your image has. So you may see more than what you see here in this video. You may see less. It just depends on what your uh, evidence has within it. You may also notice that I've skipped over some things like browser data here. And in the overview tab, there was a graphic section. There was an email section, a video section that sort of thing. While yes, you can view those in this tabs, we've created various tabs to create an environment that is best suited to viewing those types of files. So for example, even though the overview tab has an email section, it would be recommended that you actually go to the email tab to get the most out of an email investigation. Notice here on the email tab, we have a different layout than what we saw on say the overview, the summary, or even the explorer and it's displaying to us only email related information. We have our metadata, so who it was from, who it was to, any BCCs, CCs, subjects, sent time, deliver time, all that sort of information that you would be interested in about an email. Then we have the content of the email displayed below in the file content window. Over on the right, we have email conversations so that you can track up and down who the email was sent to, what the replies are, that sort of thing, so that you don't have to jump from the file list pane back down to the file content up and down. You can follow a conversation up and down through that email and see all the relevant information. When you select another email within that conversation, the interface will update. Both the file list pane will zoom in on that email and the content pane will update to display that content, of course. And then the last pane over here on the right and the bottom will display any attachments associated with that specific email. So for example, if I select guns for sale ap.jpg, we can see the picture and we can do uh, analysis on that, such as view the properties. Do we have any EXIF information? Can we tell anything about it? That sort of thing related to this image. Much like the overview tab, the email tab has some pre-built categories or filters that you can apply this will save the user time because they don't have to manually build a filter. We provide some of the basic filters to you right out of the box. So for example, if you want to filter email by sent and by a certain date, we can expand this out. We see the years as it automatically detected that we didn't have to run anything extra. It's part of the parsing process. It's going to divide these out by year 2020. Then it's going to divide it out by month. We can go to October. It's going to divide it out by day and then you could select your specific day to see all the email that was sent on, in this case, October 23rd. Now we can select 
month, day, or year. So if I select the month, then everything in October is selected. If I select the year, now we're looking at everything within that year. So you can narrow down your hits, your email, very quickly by using these quick filters over here on the side. We'll talk more about filtering in a little bit. In addition to date filtering, we also have email address filtering and domain filtering. You can also filter by two and CC and BCC automatically. Okay, it's built in. Now you can write filters, of course, to get more granular, but these are built in. So if I wanna filter by a domain, I can. So if I wanna see only gmail.com, I can select that. And now I'm looking at only emails that were sent from gmail.com. Moving on to the graphics tab. If we select the graphics tab, we are presented with an interface that's designed to make viewing large amounts of graphics very easy for the user. Thumbnail pane up top, you can narrow your search or the amount of thumbnails that you want to display over here, or in this case, I have an entire EO1 displayed. And of course, the metadata in the file list for the graphics. We can see things like capture date, make, model, lat, and long related to the graphics that we have up top. We also have the ability to add other columns. If we wanted to resolve the lat and the long to a city and a country, you can add those columns as well. Of course, selecting a graphic will display that in the file content pane. This tab is completely customizable. If you don't like this layout, you can always change it. Selecting the properties pane, you can view more metadata information that you may or may not have displayed down in the file list, such as file system information and more of the EXIF data if you wanted to see something that we didn't have listed below. FTK supports various visualization options for graphic files with location data. FTK comes with an internal map visualization tool. You can also export these graphics in two different ways into Google Earth to display the data within a Google Earth file. Okay, let's switch over to the video tab. Real quick, prior to working for Access Data, an external company, I worked as a computer forensic specialist. And one of the things that I thought was a cool feature with FTK prior to coming here as well, was the ability to create video thumbnails, but not something like YouTube where it's just one clip, but we can set configurable thumbnails to take multiple thumbnails throughout the length of a video and display those in the interface and allow me to see the full length of the video without having to manually scrub through it. So for example, here on the video tab, we can see these four videos here and we've got thumbnails throughout the thing. They don't change much on the top two, just some drone footage in the desert, but we can see in the third one where the drone is flying and we can kind of get an idea of what's viewed. And then here at the end is where we can see that, okay, we might get a picture of an individual. On top of just showing us where in the video we are, by selecting a thumbnail location, in this case, I've selected this like third one from the back, we can jump to that point in the video. So if a video is divided up into certain sections and you don't care about some, or you just wanna see something that's happening 45 minutes into a video, you don't have to scrub and try to find that spot. You can see where the thumbnail is, get in the general location, click on it, then press play, and then the video will begin playing from that location. Okay, so let's move over to the internet tab. Within the internet tab, we display internet browser history. The data in the internet tab is broken up in a couple different ways. First, we have our web page categories. This is going to divide your URLs, your cookies and your cache files into the types that they may have. So for example, we have adult links, we have computing, we have e-commerce, Facebook, Instagram, etc. Now, again, you may see more than this or less than this, depending on what your URLs in your evidence file contain. This is a dynamic list, so it's not going to show zero or anything like that. It's going to only show the categories that you have in your evidence. Helps minimize that clutter. Then we have your standard stuff for Chrome browser, in this case I'm showing, and we have the history, we can see downloads, cookies, and we're constantly adding more content to these, so be on the lookout for more categories and different things coming up in the future. History, we see down below the last visit time, the number of visit times, the title, and the URL. And when you select one here, you can see some of the content if it's been cached on the drive, giving you an idea of what that page looked like and what the user may have been looking at. Selecting another one here, 
if we don't have any cache data, FTK will display an HTML view of the metadata in the file content pane. The metadata view can help you when you're reporting or having to present or display the information as it's easy to read for, again, non-forensic users. You can pop it up on a screen, a presentation, what have you, and display that content. Otherwise, again, you can export all of the web history. Otherwise, you can export your URL history from the file list into an Excel format and open it up that way. Lastly, as far as our content tabs, we're going to switch over to our mobile data tab. Now, access data does not acquire mobile devices. Let's just get that out of the way right now. But we do parse certain mobile artifacts and we also ingest reports from mobile forensic tools such as Celebrite's UFED and Microsystemations XRY. So if you have a case that mixes cell phones and computers, you can bring those together within FTK. You dump your phone using say Celebrite and then bring the UFED report into FTK and combine those two data sets together. Also bringing in a mobile data set allows you to leverage various features of FTK against your mobile data set that has been extracted by Celebrite or XRY or whatever the case may be. Features like optical character recognition, index search. Maybe you prefer the graphics tab within FTK for viewing lots of graphics and the way that that information is presented bring it in. Maybe you want to run explicit image detection or facial recognition. All that is available within FTK against those mobile data sets if you bring in that report. So if we expand this out a little bit, mobile phone and mobile phone files, in this case we have a Celebrite UFDR or Celebrite UFED report. If we expand out mobile phone items, we can see the information that Celebrite has parsed out and we're just displaying that within FTK. FTK doesn't do any of the heavy lifting in this case. It's just reading what the Celebrate report has generated and is displaying it to you in FTK. Again, allowing you to leverage FTK features in addition to what you got within Celebrate. So if I go ahead and select something like chat message, you'll notice that the column set switches over to the chat and we can expand this out a little bit and see the messages. We can see the message app that was being used in this case, iMessage plus the phone number, whether the message was re read, sender, recipients, etc. If we switch over to the conversation view here, we display any conversations within this bubble view. If you want to report on that, it's a good output for demonstrations, presentations, etc. And down in the file list pane, you can see the associated information such as how many chats, what app was used, and who are the participants. Cool, so that's the mobile tab, and there was quite a few outtakes for whatever reason trying to say the word participants. Let's move on to searching and filtering within FTK. So moving on to searching and filtering. FTK offers the user two different methods for searching the evidence within a case, the index search and live search. An index is created during processing when it's selected by the user to be run. We'll talk about where that is configured later, but when that index is activated, the index search will search the index for the keywords that the user searches. Because the searches are not re-scanning the entire evidence, but querying a database, the searches return very quickly. For example, if I put in the search mythology and enter that, already I can see that I have 86 hits within my case that quick. In this case, it's not too large. It's about, I think, 2 million items, two and change, I think but we were able to return those hits instantaneously. Now, when we run our search, we can search now, include all files that we have, and it returns just that quick. To view our hits, we simply expand out the results and the results are broken down by file type. So if we expand out documents, documents, and select the apocalyptic manifesto and expand that out, we can select that and it's going to highlight the hit within our document that shows the result. The index search also has operator searching, so you can search for this and that, this or that. We can also search for, if I clear this, we can also search for something like California within five, five words of fire, hit add. We have 111 hits, we can search now, include all files, click okay. 
I'm going to expand that out. And we, in our documents, we have nine hits in three files. So that tracks back to a database, in this case, uh, Chromium Edge. Okay. And then it tracks back to a document.xml and then a document fires in California. And if we were to highlight that, it's going to bring us down into California Department of Forestry and Fire Protection. The user also has the ability to import search terms from a text file. So we just click on import and we would go to, in this case, our desktop and search terms.txt. It would load them in. We see four search terms, Sumter, Widow, Walther, and Lark. And we can see the number of hits that we're gonna get for each in the case. So you have a lot of flexibility in the index search and you can see how fast those searches were run because we're not searching the whole evidence again, we're just querying our index and returning the results. So it's super quick, snappy, and you can run a lot of searches in a really short amount of time. As a quick bulleted list of other features available to you in the index search, you can do regular expressions in the TR1 format, you can do stimming, you can do phonic searching, you can do synonyms, and also fuzzy searching. You can also get other words through the expand terms option where you put in one word, expand the terms is going to do a lot of other things that are similar to it as well to give you ideas of what you might want to search for as well. The live search tab offers the investigator the ability to search the case object by object at the hex level. Now, just be aware that this type of search will take some time depending on the number of objects within the case as well as the overall data size because it is doing a hex scan of the case, but it is still useful in many cases. Searching for text using the live search supports UTF-8 as well as UTF-16 or ASCII and Unicode. And then you can also, if we switch over to the pattern, search by using regular expressions. FTK comes with pre-built regular expressions that you can use to search your case, or you can of course write your own. FTK also offers the user the ability to save their custom made regular expressions into this text document. And when saved in this document, the user's custom regular expression will appear in this regular expression list so that it's available from case to case whenever you need it. Running the search may take some time depending on the size of your evidence, but you can continue to work with NFTK while a live search runs in the background. If we look at the search results from this, the live search DJI, we can see that we have a hit within a JPEG image being pulled from the file and it's going to highlight it in the hex view because that is the level at which live search searches. Those are the two searching options within FTK. Now let's talk about filtering. When I was first getting into forensics, my trainer said that you should be able to do forensics with a notepad and a hex editor. And while I get what he was saying, nobody's got time for that. And so what we want from our forensic tools and what we're using for our, from our forensic tools is to take a large amount of data and bring it down into a manageable set of files that we can go to relatively quickly, get what we need, determine if it's there or not, write a report and move on to the next one. FTK comes with a very robust filtering system that can be employed to make a lot of data really small. By clicking on filter and new, we open up the filter definition window that allows us to configure a filter. FTK does come with pre-built filters that will show many common different types of files. It will also auto create filters for you based on how many different evidence items you have loaded into your case. The FTK filter system is a rule based system. Now this isn't a training, it's a demo, but to show you how many different features you can filter by, you have a big old list of items here and it goes on and on. We're just in the M and N section here, up and down, you have the whole alphabet of different things that you can filter on. This menu here, the operator is a context sensitive. So if we were to choose something like a date, notice that it changes to match date-based filtering criteria. And then you could put your criteria in. So to build a simple one, we can go to more, down to internet data, URL history. We're gonna do URL, and then we'll do contains case insensitive, and we'll just say invader. 
Okay, simple one rule filter and we can select live preview. And this is nice because a lot of times you're going to want to filter data, but it's not something you want to save, keep in your interface. It's a one-off type thing, or you're experimenting while building the filter and you want to see the results as you go. And so you can select this live preview and it's going to show you the hits here for Invader. And so we've got a Bing search for Space Invader uh, and a blog spot on Space Invaders Infinity or whatever. Another option for filtering is using the filter manager window. If we were to open this up, you can select filters to include and as well to exclude. And these can be user created filters or FTK default filters. So if I select Bing searches, in this case, we don't want to only show Bing searches. What we're going to do is we're going to exclude Bing searches from our results. So we can see down here that we have 740 URLs loaded, but if we apply this filter to exclude Bing searches, now we're down to about 583. So we've omitted that many here and we could add more to it and also include other things to kind of start to narrow down the results. Filters can also be saved and exported out for either sharing with others or just to save them in a safe place and then they can be imported in to the case. So if I click on import filter and I navigate out to my desktop, I have a bunch of filters here dealing with Google Maps. So I'm gonna select the one that says import only and I'm gonna click open. The list will refresh itself and it imported all of the Google Maps filters. So now I have access to my Google Maps filters that break down Google map URLs into these various things like car navigation. If they set it to avoid ferries or avoid tolls or whatever like that, you can actually filter down to URLs of that and you can actually combine these as well. So you can create very dynamic and robust filters using the filter manager and the filter definition window. When using either live search or index search, doesn't matter, you can use filters to control how many files you're searching. Now, even though the index search searches so quickly across all files, you can minimize clutter by using a filter to search, say only documents, or only spreadsheets, whatever it is that you're looking for, just so that only the results displayed are within the file type that you want. Live search, it can be super helpful because it will only search the objects within your case that match that filter. In many investigations, the cyber guy, the computer guy, is not the one that knows what's going on in the case or all the bits and pieces that are connected when it comes to an investigation. And so we try to do our best reading the reports, talking with say the detective or the person in charge of the investigation to assist them in the best way that we can. But sometimes it's better to just prepare the data for them in a usable way and allow that person to look through the data and be able to pick out what they know is relevant to the case and what isn't. FTK allows you, the, the computer forensic specialist, to do the heavy lifting and then export out a portable case to say a detective or an attorney to look through the evidence and bookmark and label those things that they deem important and then you can import that back into your case and work it into an overall report or export out forensic copies, whatever the case may dictate in that instance. When you create a portable case, it'll create a directory, either in your case folder or wherever you tell it to go, and it'll create the files necessary to run the portable case and view those files. So we'll open it up, press a key to continue. In this portable case, we have a handful of files here and we can select them. We can see our spreadsheet here and we can decide, okay, is this something, do I want to bookmark it? Do I want to label it, etc. So maybe I'm going to put it into the document so I can check that there and then save it. And then I can go to the next document by simply clicking the next field and I can see the information here. Notice I still have my tabs. So we still get our full spreadsheet support. And okay, this one, you know, we've got some stuff here. Great. We can see graphic files. So we could put this in our graphics one here and we'll save that. And we can look at documents and read through the documents. And it's already been bookmarked 
it can tell that it's already been bookmarked in FTK, so you don't double bookmark, okay? So once they've gone through and they've looked at all the files that they wanna do, they have searching and all that sort of stuff, they can just close this down. As it closes, it'll write all the changes to data.db, and this directory can then be returned to the computer forensic specialist at the lab. Back at the lab, we sync that information back into FTK, and we can come in here and we see the apocalyptic manifesto, which was already in there. Remember, we saw that was checked. And we also added the ledger to our bookmarks using portable case. And we can see that pops up here. And then in graphics, if we come in, we can see that our skyscraper, let me size that best fit, our skyscraper is back in here as well. So this can help offload some of that light work uh, to the investigator while you do the heavy lifting and the forensic work in FTK. Lastly, FTK has an in-tool reporting feature that will allow you to use your bookmarks, use your filters and different things to create a dynamic report and you can export into a number of file formats, most common being like PDF and HTML, but you have other choices as well, such as Word, you can create load files. If you're gonna be sending things into uh, an e-discovery legal market, and if you don't use in-tool reporting, which I know a lot of agencies don't, FTK has a very feature-filled export option so that you can format and curate your exports and ready them for attachments in your homemade report. So now that we've covered a lot of features in the case, your hands-on, what you're actually gonna be doing through the workflow, et cetera, we're going to go back to how we set a case up in FTK. So as a reminder, this is the database management window or the case management window. And from here, you can create, edit, archive, delete, etc. all your cases. So to do that, we would go up to case and new. We would give it a case name, something like demo. Now, when creating a case, you have the option to put in various case details a reference value, whatever that is for you, a description, again, however you wanna describe something in a description file. If you were law enforcement, this could be something like an affidavit or a warrant or whatever the case may be uh, that you wanna attach here or nothing. You don't have to attach anything if you don't want to. Then below we have our processing options. You have some quick and easy buttons that will have some pre-configured settings uh, put in for FTK and generally broken up maybe by industry or discipline, such as forensic, e-discovery, legal. Uh, field mode turns off all processing options so that it doesn't do any work. It's just gonna allow you to manually navigate through everything. If you wanna do a lot of processing up front, you can. If you wanna do no processing up front and do it all piecemeal as you go through, you can also do that. It's totally up to you, the user, on where you spend the time processing your evidence. It doesn't matter if you do it up front or later, it's just where you wanna spend the time. So we'll click customize to take a look at some of the options. We're not gonna go through all of them. This is a demo, not a training. This is the evidence processing window. And here we have all the different processing options that you can set up to process the image that you're loading into your case. So based on what type of case you have, you can set the type of files that you wanna do. If you wanna deeper dive into optimizing your evidence processing, I have two videos on this channel as well that will take a deeper dive into optimizing the selections for the type of case and the amount of time that you wanna spend in processing. So check those out if that is something that interests you. Feel free to pause the video here to take a look at the list of options. Again, we're not gonna really go through them. And you can see a lot of the different things that you as the user can configure or not configure to be processed for your case. The expansion options here contains a bit more as well. Different things that can be expanded and parsed throughout the case. I'll just slowly scan through so you can see a list of the various things that we can display within the tool, okay? So feel free to take a look through that list. If you're working a case that requires that you can't even bring in certain things into your case, 
we have the evidence refinement options where you can select the types of files, date ranges, etc., that you want to bring in. You can also configure your index that manages the index search and also refine the types of files that are indexed there as well, not just the characters and different things that are indexed. You can get pretty granular. If you have custom files, that FTK may not identify or that you want to identify in a different way that FTK does by default, you can set up custom identifiers both based on extension and or file header and then FTK will categorize those in the way that you want them categorized. So you have a lot of customization options in the evidence processing window. Earlier I mentioned that this is also for standardization. So how can something be highly customizable but also support standardization? Well, you, you can save these. So if we were to select a few in here just at random and I save this user profile, I can make this, uh, I can give this a name and save it. It's going to show up here in this drop down list. We can then share those profiles to all of our users across various boxes in FTK. And then by policy say that you have to run the demo video processing option. And that way everybody's running the same option on a per case, whatever, whatever your policies dictate. Once you have your processing option chosen, you go ahead and click okay. And now your case is being created. What this means is that the database is being populated with the correct tables, it's setting up the schemas, and all that information that you're going to need to save all that stuff that we saw before into your case. Once loaded into your case, the manage evidence window will pop up, and here's where you add your evidence. You can add acquired images, physical drives, logical drives or partitions, individual files, and contents of a directory. Go ahead and pick your evidence source and click OK. You're going to navigate out to wherever it is, select your image, click open. We can parse out restore points out of the image if that is something that is necessary for your case. And if you need to make any last minute refinement changes, of course, you can make it here. Go ahead and click OK to launch the processing job. A status box will come up. It'll give you the statistics and the time that it's going to take to run the image. While the image is processing, you can browse through the case so you don't have to wait completely till it gets done. Just be aware that some things may not be processed yet, but since you know that, you can always go back and look at things if you need to once the job finishes. One feature that allows you to save time from case to case to case, as well as standardize your operations if you have a lot of people within your agency working stuff, is the ability to share many of the features from installation to installation. Things like filters, column sets, labels, processing options, regular expression searches, TR1 searches can all be shared from installation to installation to installation, allowing you to standardize certain searches, filters, and processing, as well as save you time in each case because you're not going to have to recreate those each time. All right, so that concludes our lightning round demo of FTK. There's a lot of features that we may not have touched on much, much more there, but this will give you an idea of what you can get out of FTK, how it can help you with your investigations. There are other videos on this channel that'll take deeper dives into various features, more training focused on how to use things or some tips on how to get more out of a feature. Check those out. If you have more questions, you can always comment below. If you have any questions, of course, you can reach out to us through our website to training and support. And also we can connect you with sales if you want to buy it because that's what we do. We sell software. So there's the plug. But subscribe to this channel if you want more forensic and FTK information. We post a video every week dealing with different FTK features so you can learn more about the tool. Thanks for watching.